The first line of Winnie's review is best test prep, and it gets better from there. She let us know that the material we provided helped her pass on the first attempt. We want everyone in Winnie's position to succeed. So if you're a teacher or a soon to be teacher who needs to pass your FTCE exams, you're in the right place. My name is Terry and I work with 240 to help teachers just like you pass their certification exams. This video is gonna prepare you for the science portion of the FTCE Pre-K-3. This is a test for anyone who wants to teach pre-kindergarten through third grade in the state of Florida. This video is gonna cover three things, what's on the test and how to study it, the most important concepts to master, and we're gonna look at a few practice questions. The FTCE Pre-K-3 exam is split into four subtests, developmental knowledge, language arts and reading, mathematics, and science. Each contains a certain amount of selected response questions, but for now, we're gonna focus on science, which has 50 questions in all. Ready to see what's on the science subtest? Then fire up those Bunsen burners and let's get cooking. Now the FTCE Pre-K-3 science subtest consists of five competencies. You'll need to have knowledge of effective science instruction, the nature of science, earth and space sciences, physical sciences, and life sciences. Each competency is worth between 17 and 25% of your exam. Let's start with how to teach science and take it from the top with competency one. This section of your exam covers best practices for teaching science. Expect to see questions on the best strategy to use when presenting different topics to students, identifying developmentally appropriate expectations, how to assess science knowledge, and even how to set up your classroom and facilitate a successful science lesson. Right now, I bet you're thinking, whoa, Terry, what does all that even mean? Did I get it right? Is that what you were thinking? Am I psychic? I'm definitely psychic. Anyway, let's dive into this a little more. So when we talk about best practices for teaching science, you're gonna see a lot about inquiry. Inquiry-based learning centers around developing and answering questions or solving problems from the real world. Students learn as they develop investigations, perform experiments, and seek answers with teacher-guided conversations and activities. Real science involves discovery and investigation. So if you want to teach students to think like real scientists, they have to do science, not just read about it or listen to it. Do you want to see a video about this in our study guide? My psychic power says yes. Let's do it. The nature of science involves discovery and investigation. So to learn science, students need to act like scientists. Students must do, not just read or listen. During the inquiry process, students develop the habits and skills of science as well as the ability to think critically. Students tend to understand more deeply, retain more information, and be more engaged when they discover answers themselves in context using hands-on direct experiences that can be connected to previously built knowledge and related to real-world situations. Now I knew you'd like that. So in this section, any chance you get to have students experiment with their hands, collect their own data, and generally try to figure things out on their own is best. But remember, that's only one part of this competency. You also want to know about different kinds of assessment, like formative, summative, formal, and informal, and some best practices for keeping your students safe while they're doing all that science. If you need some help brushing up on any of these concepts or anything else we go through in this video, you should check out our study guide. I'll even drop a link below in the description. Boom, one competency done. Now that we've talked about some best practices for teaching science, let's look at what you'll actually need to teach. Competency two is all about the nature of science, which is a pretty common way to say general science skills and understandings that apply no matter what kind of science your students are studying. This section includes some really big ideas, like how does science connect to other subjects in school and connect to life outside of school. And these are pretty cool because they can be woven into lessons every day. It also covers things like asking questions, developing hypotheses, collecting, measuring, and analyzing data, and scientific reporting. By any chance, does that list of skills sound familiar to you? 
Are you psychic too? Nah, that's just a scientific method. No need to brush up on those steps a bit? Let me show you a flow chart from our study guide that helps break it down. Students start by identifying a problem, then they make observations about the problem. Next, they form a hypothesis, design and construct an experiment, record the data during the experiment, and finally, draw conclusions. Often, scientists will use their conclusions to modify their hypothesis and design a whole new experiment. Now see, I have that psychic thing going on again. You're thinking, Terry, these are pre-kindergartners through third grades. How are they supposed to do all of that? Hear me out. You can ask a student in this age group simple questions like, what does a plant need to survive? Or, what do you think will happen if this plant doesn't get any water? The predictions students make are entry-level hypotheses. Then, you can help support the class through designing a basic experiment and collect class data. Your students can totally do it, with your help. So you've made it through the broad stuff that applies no matter what you're teaching. Now let's dig into the actual science knowledge. Competency three covers earth and space science. For the earth part, you'll need to know about things that make up the earth's surface and what causes it to change over time. This includes things like the water and rock cycles, plate tectonics, and even atmosphere and weather. And you need to understand the impact humans have on earth. So that's using renewable and non-renewable resources and global warming. For the space part, you need to know about the movement of the sun, earth, and moon, and what their different locations mean. So we're talking about things like seasons and eclipses. And you also need some basic knowledge of milestones of space exploration history. Whew, okay. And if you need to brush up on any of these, guess what? We got you covered in the 240 study guide but I'm not gonna leave you hanging. How about we talk about plate tectonics and how they change the Earth's surface over time? Plate tectonics is the large scale movements of portions of the Earth's crust over long periods of time. And when two plates meet, that's called a boundary. There are three kinds of plate boundaries. When two plates move towards each other, it is called a convergent boundary. As one plate is pushed below the other, the lower plate becomes part of the mantle. This is a destructive process because part of the plate is being destroyed. If two plates move away from each other, it's called a divergent boundary. This is a constructive process because as those two plates move away from each other, materials from the mantle come up to fill the gap, creating new land. And finally, if the plates push past each other in opposite directions, it's called transform boundary. And again, remember, that is just one part of the earth and space science competency. If it feels like there's a lot of material in this test, it's because there is. You can get an entire degree on just one of the topics we just talked about. So you can either spend your time Googling around, trying to figure it all out, or you could just use the 240 study guide. Now next up is physical science. In this competency, you'll need to know the basics about matter, energy, and force. In the matter section, you need to know about the states of matter, so solids, liquids, and gases, and the properties of each. And in the study guide, we've got all the information you need to know in a graphic like this one, or in a video like the one you saw earlier. So you can choose the way you learn. You'll also need to know the physical and chemical changes of matter, like when an ice cube melts or a candle burns, and how to classify matter in elements, compounds, and mixtures. For the energy portion, the biggest thing you'll need to know is conduction versus convection versus radiation. Now my psychic abilities are tingling again. You'll wanna see another video in our study guide about this section. Okay, I got you. So remember, there are three main ways thermal energy is transferred. Conduction, through a solid or between two materials that are touching. Convection, by a moving fluid and radiation by an electromagnetic wave. And remember, there's a lot more where that came from in the study guide. And that just leaves us with the fourth part of this competency. And this is the most straightforward of the bunch. You just need to know how a push or a pull will impact the movement of an object. If I push a box forward, it will move forward. The harder I push it, the faster it will go. We're almost there, one competency left. And don't forget, 
We'll do some practice questions after life science, so be sure to stick around. Now, just a heads up, there's a lot in this life science competency. And since this competency takes up about 25% of your exam, you really want to know what you're talking about. All right, so stay with me on this. Are you going to want to know all of the following? how plants and animals respond to stimuli in their environment, the basics of heredity, how to classify organisms, relationships between organisms like predation and pollination, characteristics of living things versus non-living things, the structure and function of organisms, the basics of the human body, how organisms grow and develop, sexual versus asexual reproduction, habitats, and ecosystems. Whew. All right, you guys got all that? Cause I'm about to head out. Just kidding. But you'll need to know all of what I just mentioned. So let me get you started. You need to be able to tell if something is alive. So you'll need to know the requirements of life. If something is alive, it is made of cells, responds to stimuli from the environment, maintains homeostasis, grows and develops, reproduces, and has a metabolism. If it doesn't meet all of these criteria, it is not alive. But like you saw before, there is so much more to know just in this competency alone. If you're still a little unsure about any of this, use the 240 study guide. It'll save you a lot of time, money, and a lot of worry. And remember, all of our study guides come with a money back guarantee. Now that we've gone over a big concept in each of the five areas, let's look at some practice questions to show you how they'll come up on the test. Let's start back at the top with inquiry. Which of the following activities best illustrates an activity related to using scientific inquiry in the classroom? A. Presenting a testable question and having students follow lab instructions to determine the answer. B. Providing students with various materials and lab equipment and asking them to use them to see what they can find out. C. Helping students identify a problem and develop testable questions that might lead to a solution. Or D. Permitting students to search the internet as they fill in the blanks on a science worksheet. An engaging part of scientific inquiry is allowing students to participate in the process of identifying problems to solve and asking questions that might lead to a solution. So C is the best answer. How about a question on the scientific method? A student performed an experiment on three different types of paper towels. Each of the towels was soaked in a separate beaker, each containing 20 milliliters of water for exactly 15 seconds. The towels were removed. What steps should be next in the procedure in order to accurately identify the paper towel that absorbed the most water? There is only one answer here that allows us to get a measurable difference in our paper towels, which is super important when conducting an experiment. Choice A is correct. To accurately compare the paper towel absorption, the amount of water remaining in each of the beakers must be measured and compared after removing the soaking paper towels. Time to move into the science disciplines you'll be responsible for teaching. First up, Earth and Space Science. Now, I know I talked about plate tectonics before, but I'm going to throw you a little curveball. Let's see a question about rock cycles. Which of the following rocks are formed from molten material? Shale, igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic? Metamorphic kind of sounds like molten, so let's try that one out. Ah. Metamorphic rocks are usually changed by heat or pressure. The correct answer here is B. Igneous rock is rock that is solidified lava or magma. I'm feeling like you might be a little bit annoyed with me for giving you a question I didn't prepare you for. So how about I make it up to you with a question from the space section. What period of time can be measured by roughly one revolution of the moon around the earth? One decade, one year, one month, or one day? Choice C is best. It takes roughly one month for the moon to revolve around the Earth. Let's move on to physical science. Remember conduction, convection, and radiation? How does heat from the sun travel to the Earth? Right away, we can cross cell photosynthesis. That's a process done by plants to create sugar that can be used as energy. The sun warms the planet by sending heat in the form of electromagnetic waves. This means radiation is the best answer. 
ready for life science? The survival of any living thing is directly dependent upon air, water, shelter, and which of the following? Carbon dioxide, sunlight, sexual reproduction, or nutrition? Both reproduction and nutrition were on the list we looked at earlier, but the key here is that not all organisms use sexual reproduction. Some reproduce asexually. So D is the best answer. Now that's just a small sample of practice questions to give you an idea about how these concepts will appear on the test. For a full practice test, click the link in the description below. Congrats on finishing the video. If you enjoyed it, give us a like. 240 has helped thousands of teachers pass their certification exams, and we want to help you as well. So take the next step and subscribe to the 240 study guides. They have hours of videos so you can watch or listen as you please. It is test aligned so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions so you can be sure that you're ready. And it has a money back guarantee. So click that link in the description below and get started today.